sit back and relax because later on meal time
Sound check. One, two, three. Sound. Mic test. Testing mic. One, two, three. This is a mic test. One, two. Sound check. One, two, three. Sound testing. Welcome. Kindly fill in the chairs. May mga um, available chairs pa tayo dito sa harap. Mic test, sound check, one, two, three. Sound testing mic. This is a mic test, one, two, three.
Sound. Sound testing. everyone uh, before we begin let us all stand for the ecumenical player uh, to be followed by the singing of the philippine national anthem in the, name of the son and of the holy spirit amen our most gracious heavenly father we come to you today to praise and worship you and give you thanks for all the things you continue to provide for ourselves and our families. Father, we humbly ask for forgiveness for all the times you have offended you. Continue to guide and protect us, Lord. Bestow upon us your unending grace and healing that we may in turn become instruments of gentleness and compassion to others. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with prayer and intercession of our Blessed Mother. Amen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. Allahumma hadina al-sirat al-mustaqim. Allahumma wahid sufufana bayna al-muslimina wa al-nasara wa al-lumadi ila siratika al-mustaqim Allahumma amnahum al-aisha bil-amni wa al-salamati wa al-tanmiyati al-mustadamati fi madinat Dabao Allahumma la tusik qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahhab Rabbana atina fi al-dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana tawqina adab al-nar Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Amoy nen manama kami gimu tolangon Manotot kakaroson no Si koi kau kami toku tolangon Huwai migtumpi to tanah Si koi kau kami bohoy to kopianan tolangon no maotaw Pusako ka pusuno Kana akong to pabulos ko'y Oagbuyo ko'y 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 bohay ka't pabur Kahalaan, kalinaw, taro ka nami No pag-ugpo, ko'y kasabo ka ko'y Oyot ka lambo Kahit kuro tamana ka ko din panubad O'y pag-ampo, kaupianan ni ko'y no O'y kakoy ko ni mo no O'y kahalaan ko lang mo Let us have a moment of silence. We remember the life of Dr. Aponda. He has done a lot, not just in the department, but uh, as well as the university. Uh, you will be continue. Uh, we will be remembered, Sir Nilo, and we will continue the legacy that you built. The DMPCS family will surely miss you. Ilang manan, alam ng puso 
You may now be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. In celebration of UP Mindanao's 29th foundation anniversary um, for CSM Week, we welcome you to the DMPCS Lecture Series 2024. A round of applause, please. So I hope that you are all excited to witness um, the researchers um, for their exemplary research today. So uh, there's a lot in store for you in our talks. So um, without further ado, let us uh, welcome uh, the chair of the uh, RDE of the Department of Mathematics, Physics, and Computer Science for the opening remarks, Professor uh, Alex Almacera. Thank you very much, Sir Kenneth. And I'm actually very happy that this room is very jam-packed with very eager students, as well as those who are online. So thank you very much. Welcome, welcome everyone to the lecture series. Um, so this is part of the CSM week and also to be in line with the 29th founding anniversary of UP Mindanao. Um, we planned to hold the DMPCS lecture series uh, in order to update not just the CSM, but now the entire UP Mindanao community and all our colleagues from across the country and hopefully around the world on the current research activities undertaken by our amazing DMPCS faculty. So we have four, uh, we have four speakers with us. So if your name is, uh, if you if I mention your name, please stand up to be recognized. We have Mom Kim Dayan Sab Ligue Sabio. So that's she'll be giving a talk on uh, African swine flu. We also have uh, we also have Professor Romel Rial who will be talking about inverse problems. And for those who really love data science and machine learning, we have a powerhouse, Professor Vladimir Kobayashi. <laughs> and yours truly, I will. And yours truly, I will be talking about in-host COVID nineteen dynamics. So uh, um. I really want to take this opportunity to thank a lot of people because um I, I because the past few weeks we have been so busy with um CSM week and a lot of uh, also our faculty duties as well as um our classes. So I would like to thank everyone for dedicating their time and efforts to make this event a success despite our busy schedules and the ongoing CSM week activities. We hope we can make the best of everyone, uh, everything. Um, I want to thank everyone involved in the planning and implementation. It was really a pleasure to coordinate with them. Uh, the RDE committee for helping with the activity design. The social info co committee for the pop mats, the programs and the spiels that you are seeing right now. The dean, uh, Sir, Sir Ting uh, Naniola for supporting this activity. The CSM student council for helping us, uh, for coordinating with us to make sure that there will be maximum participation. Um, we, I would like to personally thank the speakers for giving their valuable time to show their expertise. To the ITO for accepting our request to make this event hybrid, even if it was short notice. Uh, special thanks to Mom Bina for taking the call to help moderate the talks. To all students, faculty, colleagues, UP, the UP Mindanao Committee, and everyone attending here and watching live. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for so much for your presence and for your full support. Um, we hope that you will take away some learning about the uh, amazing work that is done by our department. And stay tuned for more events from our DMPCS because we have some more lectures lined up this year soon. So please look forward. Thank you very much, sir. So I really hope that the students here are excited for our lecture series. Excited ba kayo? Kasi merong quiz mamaya, okay? So after every ano, talk, may, may ano po tayo, short quiz. Okay lang ba yun? Of course, meron tayong incentive. Merong quiz, sir. May mga incentive mamaya. Okay. Um, let us now start our first speaker. Uh, she is a, an alumna of the BS Applied Mathematics Program here in UP Mindanao. So, product po siya dito sa UP Mindanao and graduated magna cum laude. 
She then earned her Master of Science degree in Information Technology at the CMU, CMU na lang, Carnegie, Me Carnegie Mellon University in Adelaide, South Australia with highest distinction. So, hindi basta-basta yung ating roster today, no? So, her team proposed a research to conduct an epidemiological study on the spread of the African swine fever in Region 11. And this project was funded by UP Mindanao through the Office of Research. And this is an in-house creative work, uh, work and research grant. So, today, the, as their project approaches its end, she will... She will share with you the highlights of their findings. So let us all welcome Assistant Professor Kim Dayan Ligue Sabi. Where do I point? Hello, good afternoon. Battery. <laughs> ah, there it is. Okay, I don't, I, I can share. Right now, good afternoon. I volunteered to go first so that we can start with the less hardcore math and more multidisciplinary research. So, this is an advertise to our applied math students and our computer science students as well how we can apply our research, not just on our own, but also, you know, to spread and apply it multi multidisciplinary, right? So in this research, we conducted spatial, uh, spatial temporal patterns and risk factors of the African swine fever in Southern Philippines. Have you heard of the African swine fever or ASF? Yes, all right, so that's a 20% nod. It's a non-zoonotic disease. What do we mean by that? have no idea. We are applied math comsci group. Non-zoonotic disease, ibig sabihin, it cannot infect people. But it infects animals. All right. So ASF in particular, it infects the pigs, the swine population. All right. So it infects the swine, but it does not infect the, peop the humans, people. Then why do we need to study them? Right. Correct. It's highly contagious and fatal. In three to seven days incubation period, the, the pig infected would start vomiting, high fever, and then extreme weakness, and then many of them will die. And if not controlled, it could result to total zero swine population. No more pork. Do you want that? No. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully not. Because... They need the applied math in this in this adepende. All, right. All right, most of us know some okay lang. Depende kung mus All right, okay. This is only 15 minutes, so if I can have your attention, that would be great. I we will not dig into the hardcore math, more more what we found. But I want to start, before anything else, with uh, introducing our team. As I said, multidisciplinary. So this is uh, together with the Department of Biological Sciences and Environmental Studies. So you have me, and of course, we also have from SOM, UP scientist and full professor Alviola. We conducted the spatial temporal part and the regression modeling, the, science, the math part. And of course, we have Dr. Mijares. He is a doctor of veterinary medicine. We need him because we're studying swine. And of course, our very own chancellor herself, uh, Professor Murao, our disease expert. And so they helped us make sense of our statistical results, which is great, right? So sometimes we need experts to help us understand the numbers, right? And of course, hard work of uh, special mention to Mr. Mark Lacaba. He is a thesis student. Uh, he... By the, by the end of this course, pwede na siya mag-applied math. He learned new sets of tools, even though bio siya, just to finish this research. So we would not have been able to do this without him. All right? So now, why African swine fever? So as I said, the swine industry, it constitutes a significant portion of the agriculture, uh, uh, agriculture sector in the country, marking its importance both economically and in terms of food security. Now, in particular, the, hog, the hogs, 
or the swine, they represent the highest livestock inventory in the country. So threat of the ASF, the outbreak of the ASF would pose a substantial threat to these swines. Now, in particular, Region 11, it represents uh, the it's it's the fifth top primary producer of swine in the country, which means you know it it's a sub it's a primary yeah, it's a primary contributor of swine production production in this in this nation. So in this talk, uh, in our research, we focus on Region Eleven in particular, Philippines. All right now, uh, in February twenty twenty, the African swine fever was introduced into the Philippines, and this resulted into considerable economic losses and how considerable at least three million pigs were culled as a result of the spread and this amounted to as much as 135 billion pesos by 2021 alone all right so now this underscores the importance of finding the risk factors of of the of the asf transmission now what did the what do they do in investigating ASF outbreaks, we already have studies, but particularly in Estonia, China, and South Korea. So what they did, they studied the spatial temporal patterns and risk factors of ASF outbreaks in this country. All right. But what about the Philippines? We are affected too. All right. So inspired by this research, we came up with our research. And specifically, we came up with a three-part methodology. All right. A hardcore Nina project. All right. First part. Spatial temporal analysis, space and time using GIS. Second part, risk factor analysis. We conducted regression modeling. Third part, key informant interviews, right? So we were hopeful that the qualitative information that we will get from these KIIs would be able to complement the quantitative results of our uh, spatial temporal and risk factor analysis. And hopefully it will give us a clearer general picture of ASF prevalence in the region. Okay, right away, materials and methods. We studied re uh, Region 11, all of its five provinces, and one highly urbanized city, which is Davao City, for a to total of 1,162 barangays. For spatial temporal analysis, we, can, uh, we gathered data from the DA. Thank, uh, thank you that DA partnered with us. So they gave us the officially reported number of ASF cases from the first ever reported case until now. And then gener uh, we generated maps from these positive cases using ArcGIS Pro 3.1, AMAT 192193. Spatial <laughs> autocorrelation. We performed global Moran's eye statistics to find uh, spatial autocorrelate, uh, to, to investigate spatial autocorrelation. And for the conceptualization of spatial relationship, we applied the zone of indifference with distance bands at one kilometer. And this is chosen by an expert, our vet med, because this best explains the 1710 zoning protocol that they applied to mitigate ASF. And for the hotspot analysis, we have a Getis or GI star statistic. For the risk factor, we only focus on one uh, municipality which is New Corellia in Davao del Norte. New Corellia, that's a second-class municipality in Davao del Norte. And we chose this because at the time that we were conceiving this project, there is reported the highest number of cases in Davao del Norte. <laughs> All right, and then we conducted primary data collection where we surveyed case and control farms, where we evaluated 33 potential risk factors in total. And how did we identify identify these 33 potential risk factors through related literature. And then we perform conditional logistic regression modeling uh, to find the associated risk factors where we use a one-is-to-one -one matching design. And finally, but not uh, informant interviews of our ex ASF exports. We interviewed the ASF regional coordinator himself from DA11. And then we also interviewed veterinarians from the Davao City Veterinarian Office and each of the five provincial veterinary offices of the five provinces. And of course, because of we conducted, our study protocol was subjected under ethical considerations. So yeah, it underwent a full board review and by the UPMIN Research Ethics Committee, which was approved last March 17. Okay, the juicy part, results. Part one, spatial temporal analysis. 
Right, so what we did, we studied this in quarters because there was less variation in the data. So from February 2020, that's the first ever reported case until last year, 2023, 11 quarters were evaluated. Of those 11 quarters, only five resulted in significant clustering, which are shown here. So we conduct, uh, we identified the hotspots of these five clusters. Okay, now, First quarter of 2020, that's a clustering. So what you will see here in this lower part, this is Davao Occidental. What you will find in Davao Occidental, Malita. If you heard from the news, Malita is the ground zero. Specifically, you will find here Don Marcelino. That's a third class municipality in Malita. And that's where the first ASF reported case in region 11. No, in the entire Mindanao was reported. So we have here our ground zero, and then we also have here later in after Don Marcelino, some in Davao City. So this is Davao City, right? Okay, now in the third quarter, we move to the upper portion of Davao Occidental and to the lower portion of Davao del Sur. And then for the fourth quarter, here in Davao del Norte and then Compostela Valley. And then for the first quarter, and the upper portion of the Davao Oriental, Nadariang Mati, as well as different portions of the Davao, um, of Davao Oriental. All right, two things I want to emphasize. First thing, if you notice, the hotspots are not reoccurring in the same area, right? They are located in different places. We, are, we also perform emerging hotspot analysis, and we confirm that there is indeed no reoccurring hotspots. And that's good news. Because they did, the government did apply an extreme measure to control ASF. So, kaning ground zero, they called thousands and thousands of pigs. Miski pagwalay sakit, as long as it's within the one kilometer zone, so 1710 protocol, right? And because of that, we now see the result that it was indeed. <laughs> All right, as I was saying, we did see, we, we do see now that it was indeed effective in controlling the reoccurrence of ASF in the region, right? So that's great. But you will also see that nagakatag ang ASF, right? There's transboundary movement. Why is that, right? We will answer that with the KIIs, all right? Here are some news clippings. So we did this to in order to corrobor corroborate and contextualize the maps, right? So we found the news that would help us explain the maps. Okay, and this is the total number of affected farms from 2020 until last year, the last reported case. So I just want to show you that there are relatively fewer hotspots, and that's great. Pero a few, quite a few barangays have been affected. The highest number is in Don Marcelino here in Dovo Occidental. Um, as much as 711 farms were affected. But as I re as I want to repeat, it's the ground zero, and on ground zero, not that pinakalala. So we learned from the ground zero infection, which is good news. Okay, now risk factor analysis. What are the factors that are significantly associated with the increase in ASF infection? But before that, wow, photo up. This is for the OR. <laughs> that, all right, so we have here, uh, we went to New Corellia and we were fortunate that we have been warmly welcomed by their mayor herself. Very pretty mayor, Mayor Federiso. And then she connected us with their municipal agriculture office. Right. And then here is their Mao himself, Engineer Orashon. And then this lady beside me is uh, Dr. Embarte, their municipal vet. And together they helped us identify the farms to survey. Okay. And because and with their help, we were able to survey 142 farms in total. 72, 71 farm case, 71 control farms. All right, and then uh, these are their locations in New Corellia. All right, so based on the survey that we conducted, out of the 33 potential risk factors, the following are significant. All right, so what you want to do, this is logistic regression. So we can look at the odds ratio, OR. And then when you look at the OR, if it's less than one, ibig sabihin, it's significantly decreasing the likelihood. If it's greater than one, it's significantly increasing the likelihood of ASF transmission. So if you use treated water for drinking, that reduces the risk. Otherwise, if you use deep well, you know that increases the risk. 
if you, okay, skip ng isolation because it's controversial. Use disinfectant after cleaning pens. Farm has dedicated vehicle for transport where, when they require drivers to adhere to biosecurity protocols that significantly reduce the risk. All right. Now, if you also see here, when you practice swill feeding, that significantly increases the risk by 6.4 to 6 times. Swill feeding, so bisaya pa. What's swill feeding? Lamao. Pagpakauno ng mga baboy o lamao, that significantly increase the ASF transmission by seven, almost seven times more. Okay. Right? So, balik-balik na na siya sa literature and it, and it has been proven again. Dapat dili pa kaunod o glamaw ang mga baboy. Especially sa backyard farms. Okay. Now, let's go back to the isolation of sick. Ideally, what you would imagine, pag nasakit ang baboy, ilahi siya. Diba? That's a good thing to do by security protocol. Pero dili na mag-spread. But why does it result in an increase ASF transmission? Right? So, we were really thankful that we performed the KII. Because there we found that by isolating the sick, ibig sabihin dahil sa mga farmers, ginalahi nila ang baboy para i-dispose. What do we mean by dispose? Backyard slaughter. So either they consume it themselves or ibaligya paspas before madunggan na giihaw nila ilang baboy. Mo na lang pasabot na isolate nila lang sick. They do not, wala na intention nga ayuhon pa ang baboy. Ilahi na diretso katayon. All right. And because, well, if you do that, usually, ang nag, ginabuhat lang na, pag nadunggan nga na, ASF. Wala, na ASF, nasakit ang baboy, ihaon na na siya. Hence, ni increase ni among isolation of sick. Okay? All right, so the rest na, uh, not significant. Okay, cocaine informant interviews. Interesting, right? Uh, before that, uh, here's a evidence that we did conduct our key informant interviews from the PBOs and CBOs all around Region 11. <laughs> all right. And from the KIIs, six themes, important themes emerged. The first theme, of course, we are grateful na nanggawas gitong mga uh, farm biosecurity issues that corroborated the result of our risk factor analysis. So they did mention about the water source for drinking, they explained how they dispose the sick, neglecting infection, not using the proper disinfectant, kay mahal daw ang disinfectant, and pagpakaon sa lamaw. Okay? And of course, uh, there's also inadequate disposal of feces, not using dedicated vehicles, and not and complacency in drivers' adherence to biosecurity protocols. All right. So that supported the result of our risk factor analysis. But there's five more themes that we found interesting, starting with theme two. The influence of traders, right? What do you mean by traders? They the interviews they use it synonymously with viajeros, and by viajeros we mean these are the some would even say unscrupulous traders who would go around town and then convincing farmers to sell their pigs quick and at, at a lower cost. Kay padulong ng ASF. Wena na ASF sa pikas barrio mato na nadiri so. Kataya na yung baboy, ibaligya sa ako, ako'y bahala o dispose. Right? Okay, so, nagbalik-balik niya siya sa mga interviews. They are a significant value chain actor. And also, of course, as you can imagine, dili lang isa ka-farm ang i-visit sa trader. They would visit many farms, right? In that, in that area. And as you can imagine, they would also not, dili nila top priority ang pag-follow sa biosecurity protocols. So, they become one of the important carriers of the disease. So, mo ato ka nga farm, possibly nga na ASF, ato sa Tapikas farm, give daladala niya ang ASF, which possibly explains the transboundary movement. Nga nung nawala ng ASF, di rin mo balihin man yun sa Tapikas. Kaya nangita yun o asa kabaligyan sa baboy. Right? Okay. So, the tra traders have a strong influence and they are potential carriers. Team three, okay, farmer profile and capability. As you can imagine, the, what we interviewed are backyard farmers, right? So you can imagine there would be general lack of awareness on ASF and policy education. In fact, so February 2020, we've never been hit with ASF. First time. So ito pag learn unsa da yung ASF and then how to control it, right? And of course, uh, here is a theme, no livestock insurance for swine. This 
encourage them to deal with the traders. Kay kung nai insurance ang imong swine, tagaan kag 5k per baboy. That is less than what they would have earned kung nabaligya nila at the standard price. But i compared to viajeros, arang-arang na ni siya. Na since wala man sila insurance, so ni deal na lang sila with the viajeros, you know, which ultimately led to the ASF transmission. So isa sa mga ginapush sa DA, hopefully, unta kay nana insurance ang mga mag-apply for insurance ang mga backyard farm owners. Now, also the good thing about this, kay it also forces the backyard farms to have the minimum biosecurity level measures in place. Kaya pag wala sila sa minimum biosecurity, dili sa tagaan o uh, swine. So kanang mga mag-thesis, pwede na siya ninyo sa dihan. Kung mag-apply kung mag ba yun o insurance, maka-help ba siya sa mga farmers. Pero for now, money ang nigawas sa mga KII. Ngayon ang DA. Okay. No organized group for farmers. So, lisod ang pag-address of concerns of provider assistance. And of course, ang general economic capabilities of farmers. Naninkamot na lang ganit sila makaginan siya sa baboy. Pagastuhon pa yun sila to implement these biosecurity protocols. Right? And four of six influence of veterinarians and para-veterinarians, para there would be accidental oversight. Wala gituyo sa pag-commits, sa pag-handle sa swine, so na-infect. And there would also be forced oversight, right? Because as you can imagine, we are mainly dealing with commercial vets and public para vets na nakakontrata, right? So there is incentive to look the other way, to follow their employer's prerogative. Idili pa lang sila, i-renew silang amo, so dili na lang i-report ang ESF. Issues related to checkpoints, five of six. Okay. Transport at night. As you can imagine, isnik ang baboy, ipataka sa gabi eh, sa mga traders para mabaligya sa laing lugar. Underfunding of checkpoints, dili nila mabantayan 24-7 ang mga checkpoints. So usually, 8 to 5, halimbawa niya, mga contractual lang pa dyan na siya ang mabutang dira. Kay walay funding, so underfunding. Right? So that also was made it difficult to check sa mga ginapalusot. Irregularities at checkpoints. Na yung mga informants nag-report o questionable financial transactions with the traders para mapalusot ang baboy. And several entry points or new roads. Okay, this is this should be a good thing na yung mga uban provinces nga nag-construct o new roads pero at the same time, naglisod na silang bantay kaya underfunded, underfunded na ganyan checkpoints na naghan pag yun ang batayan na checkpoints. Okay, last na. General lack of documentation for swine traceability. Right? So, first, na ay mga infection sa mga slaughterhouses. Wala nakalista ng mga baboy ginapasulod na dito ginaslaughter. Dapat naka-trace ang mga baboy. And of course, backyard slaughter. Connected ni siya ganyan sa isolation of sick. Ideally, kung mag-backyard slaughter ka, ikaw lang bukaon, unya, ang imuhang ipakaon, dili po niyong ipakaon. Ang mga lamaw, dili pa abot sa baboy para dili mo balhin. Ay. Ayun na ni. Okay, recommendations. Right, so first, dapat i-register and standardize ang mga operations sa viajeros, ideally. Second, strengthen the campaign for swine insurance, in inevitably encouraging farms to set in place basic biosecurity measures. Third, swine farm registration. Fourth, funding for the barangay biosecurity officers. And fifth, upholding ordinances related to biosecurity in the LGUs. Ibig sabihin na ni, si DA na asya'y ordinance, pero ay, na asya'y guidelines, pero unless i-inact siya sa ordinance sa LGU, wala na siya'y ngipon nga mo paak para i-uphold ang law. So hopefully, um, ma-push pa na. Okay, references. Uh, very quick lang, I just want to thank UP Mindanao through the Office of Research for funding this research under the in-house uh, research and creative work grant. And of course, the Department of Agriculture Bureau of Animal Industry for their support. Questions? All right. Thank you very much, Ma'am Diane. So uh, the floor, ayan, the floor is now open for questions regarding Ma'am Diane's topic. May mga questions pa tayo. Ah, ganito na lang. Before that, magpapakwiz tayo, of course. 
So merong reward. Ang, ang reward ay ito lang naman. Imported chocolates by ano by Aling Nena. Okay. All right, so if you know the answer, mag-raise lang kayo ng hand. Okay? Sige. Sorry, may mga, pa may mga pa quiz ha. Sige, first question na ang ating reward ay chocolates from Doc Chin's office. Okay. So name the three-part, name only one sa three-part methodology conducted in this, hala ka, dali lang, dali lang. Ang dami pala. Ay, naminaw, Judy, ayaw mo. <laughs> wait lang, wait lang. Baba mo na ng kamay. Sandali lang. Baba mo na. Guys, baba mo na. Di na makita, guys. Huwag kasi mauna. Okay. Sige. Name only one of the three-part methodology conducted in this research. Go! Hala! Then nakita na ako. Si me. Ah, sige, name three na lang. O, Agad-agad. Wait lang. Uh, okay lang, para marinig kasi ng ano. Meron kasi, ka tayong, meron kasi tayong online presence, so need talaga ng mic. So, name, sige, name three na lang. Ganun. So, the three methodologies used are spatial-temporal spatial analysis, risk factor analysis, and the KII or the Kian for month interviews. Alright. Thank you very much. Hindi lang yung price mo kasi tatlo yung na-answer mo. Tatlo din yung ano mo. Chocolates. Imported na siya ha. Okay, sige. Meron pa tayong tanong. Sige. Identify only one of the six important themes that emerge from the key informants interview go yeah yes yes ikaw yes one one only uh. <laughs> lapit ka para ano only one just one the influence of traders all right congratulations at dahil one lang one lang din yung chocolate okay lang Pwede rin six. Kung gusto mo six chocolates. Okay, sige. Um, sige, um, if there are questions regarding Ma'am Diane's research, now would be the best time for those questions. So kung meron ba kayo, meron kayong mga um, tanong about sa research itself or baka about sa method, kung sino yung nagtitesis dito, right? Yung mga seniors or mga third years, ay especially yung mga third years. Sino ba nagsa-spatial temporal analysis sa, sa third year? I see. Wait lang. Si Sir Romel, merong question. And later on, meron tayong questions sa Zoom. Of course, yung mga Zoom people, you can ask your questions right away. Yes, sir? Uh, curious lang about sa ano, mga backyard farmers. Uh, what, un, unsa ka dako yung scale of production? Kung, kung tigpila sila, kababoy lang usually ginano. And how do they compare sa mga large scale na mga kuan? Kaboyan sa... Thank you, sir. Nana, siya yung specific qualification para matawag ka na backyard farms. Oh my God. <laughs> Murag, less than, ay nasa 10, di mo lang pa 30. Pero daghan na na. Na ay mga isa lang kabuok, duha lang, backyard farmers na na sila. Di lang malapas. Okay, meron po tayong question from our online audience. Okay, this is this is from Sir Lay Openya. Hello, sir. Um, sige, Ma'am Dayan, were the results endorsed to DA sa Department of Hi, Lay. Wala pa. Wala pa mi na human. Ongoing pa ang project. Pero share na na mga results. So we are writing up now the paper and then we will definitely endorse to the DA and all the PVOs, CVOs. 
So ongoing pa po yung kanilang process, sir. Thank you very much. All right, what else from the students here? May mga tanong ba? Yes. Paan daw, ma'am? If I ask consumers po, meron po ba daw parang risk factor involved sa consumers or may apple ba daw mga ways na makahelp ang consumers na kanang dili ma-spread ang ASF? That's a really good extension of this research. So, pwede siya na another topic. I will not guess an answer kaya wala na siya sa part sa mong scope. So, sa backyard farms lang may kutok. But definitely, sa mga mag-thesis, daghag uh, pwede nga i-study. Ay, saan na siya? Consumers na part. At dahil, John Mart, ikaw daw yung mag-thesis doon. Okay lang. Pwede ka na mag-pasign kay Ma'am Chin doon. All right. What else? Are there any more questions regarding Ma'am Diane's topic? Sa likod, how about from other courses from Computer Science and BS? Ay, na-ay chocolate ang mga tana. Ay, oo nga. Sige, sige. Sige, kay ugo man ang tanan. Tagaan na lang tamog chocolate. Ay, ikaw po, sir. Nakuta na mga sir. Si Lay, Lay, ipadala na lang na ako via, ano Lay, JRS. Alright, wala na ba? Uh, yes, yes sir Alex. So it's really nice that ano, this project also involved the collaboration with the go local government units po. Um, my question po is, ano, for, especially for those who might be considering, ano, maybe collaborating with LGUs later or, or in the future, um, what challenges have you encountered when coordinating with these LGUs? Correct. Ang scheduling uh, doc, Lex. Ang amuang funding sa OR, nahurot, <laughs> libre na lang ang amuang mga statistical analysis. Ang pag-gather good sa data. Uh, halimbawa, if, go, if you go to New Corellia, you don't just go to the backyard farms. You have to do a courtesy call with the mayor first. And then si mayor, dalaon ka sila, municipal agriculture officer. And then ang, ang mao ang magdala sa farms. So da ay mga kana, nga step na i-follow para welcome ka dito. Otherwise, mga tingalas lang. Kinsang mana? Mga taga-UP, napabayatay. Reputation. <laughs> Alright, so, uh, yes po. And then, that's also the same what we did with the CVOs, PVOs. Naguna mi sa DA first, and then, ilang mi gi endorse sa mga provincial and city veterinary offices. Alright, thank you very much, ma'am. So, wala na ba? Yes, meron pa tayong question sa Zoom. Alright. This is from Ma'am Miko Castro from SOM. Okay, so... Um, hi, Ma'am Kim. Great presentation. I was particularly interested in the role of the trader. So, uh, gusto niyang malaman kung what potential policies would be applicable for this. Uh, most of the policies um, kasi are directed towards the producers and consumers. So, what about the midstream actors? Mamiko, happy to know you're here. That's a really good question, ma'am. Collaborate na punta with SOM. Because Kanisha does not our focus on our risk factors, but it's just an important theme that came up. So realize na important sa day to look into the traders. So what policies that I I hope we would conduct another more thorough study to really determine unsa na siya. But for now, we only determine that this is important to look at. So Multidisciplinary research is the future. Let's do that. <laughs> so si Ma'am Kim po yung ating trailblazer for African swine fever. At si Mert ang yung mag-finishing sa, ano, sa research na yun. Thank you very much, Ma'am Miko, for that question. What else from the students? Wala na ba? Ayun, meron pa. Uh, if this is endorsed to DILG, makompel na sila na mulihog. Ay, com ano to? Comments lang pala to. Okay. <laughs> Tama. You agree, ma'am? Yes. Meron? Wala na. Okay, going once, going twice. Sige. So, 
I just want to add, it's a good thing now we have a Southeast Asia wide na study on African swine fever. I will be joining that team as a PhD student itself. So magiging entry na ako ng study sa Region 11, and then we will go national and even Southeast Asia na level. So don't worry about it. Tama jud ka, murag African swine fever ako life for the next few years. So uh, we'll keep you posted. Congratulations, ma'am. Okay. All right. So, kung wala nang questions, we will now proceed uh, with our next speaker. At ang ating next speaker ay ano, missing action pa. Anyway, um, so kailangan pa ba to ng introduction, guys? Yung ating next speaker? Or ano ba? Mag-post na lang ko dere o ano, resume niya. All right. So, our next speaker is a certified analytics prof professional and an associate professor here, of course, in UP Mindanao, a product also here in UP Mindanao. He received the Erasmus Mundus Master Course in Data Mining and Knowledge Management Scholarship. Um, after he landed, not top 100, but top seven out of 2,000 people and pursued a double master's degree in data mining and Yes, you knowledge management. He also received the Marie Curie Initial Training Network Fellowship, which enabled him to pursue a doctorate degree in data science. So his passion for his craft is not only seen within the academe, but also beyond. So meron din siyang uh, mga partnerships with private institutions and other universities. Um, he developed the Marine Litter Project, which aims to create a simple and cost-effective technology to monitor and quantify marine litter in shallow coastal areas in Dava region. So currently, he is the program coordinator of the BS Data Science here in CSM. San yung mga BSDS dyan? Kawai, kawai. All right. And you also served as the university registrar in 2000, uh, 2020 to 2021. So a lot of his research interests include deep learning techniques applied to text images and videos, sequential data analysis, and Bayesian modeling. So please help me welcome. Please help me welcome Associate Professor Vladimir B. Kobayashi. Okay, thank you. Pwede ma... Hello, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good, good afternoon sa tanan, no? So, actually, dili din siya burak lecture. Bura siya ka ng, let's say it's a uh, practical, no? Practical lecture. So, I encourage everyone to, kung meron kayong access sa computer, so we can have some, ano, some analysis. No? So, I will be discussing about reading texts without reading them, No? So how can we read without reading them? <laughs> so we let the computer read them, yeah? Topic modeling and text summarization. Okay, so what is our goal for this training? So I will introduce to you the fascinating... Wala lagi. Okay, introduce to you the fascinating field of text mining or text analytics. Okay? And its potential in your own research. So I was listening to the, ano, no, to the talk of... Oh, Ma'am Dayan. And then they actually use their KAI. So they actually 
Did you analyze text there? Yes. So they are analyzing text. So how did you analyze the text? Manual. No, you can just imagine ilang ka documents ang gi-analyze. So pila ka seven interviews. So around 70. Okay. So scale that up to 1 million documents. Kaya manual wala. Okay. So maybe this talk will also help with us no if you are going to conduct a KAI or a focus group interview. Okay, so I will start the uh, discussion on why we apply text mining and how to apply text mining, which is the more important. <laughs> okay, so we'll discuss this. So, ano na lang ako kay Bere, one hour ba yan akong talk? So, I don't want to exceed. So, ano lang na to, uh, pasadahan na nato na nan. Okay, so text data. So, what is text data for you? So, do you think this is text data? Yes, that's text data. But with a hashtag. As man, ginagamit ng hashtag. Comments, tweets, di ba? Naman po na. Kaya na, how about that? It's HTML, right? So there's a markup, no? It's a markup language. So H1 there. So if you open the website, makita niyo, wala kayo makita ng H1, H1. It's actually in the background, no? Yung HTML na term natin. How about that one? Of course, that is actually a text. This one, with a at, okay? How about that one? You think that's a text? Huh? Yes, it should be a text. But it represents something. Emojis, yeah. So, sino pa ang gumagamit ng mga emoji? Huh? Kinsa? Ang mga chick. Di ba? Emoji. <laughs> Di ba? So, they don't use the Latin alphabet. They actually use mga ano, mga Egyptian hieroglyphics, no? Those are texts, but they are in pictures. Ama? So, yan yung ating variety of texts that we will encounter in our lives, di ba? But what makes text analysis Challenging. It's because of what we call this ambiguation. So same word can be used in different contexts. Sa atin, it's very easy because we are human. Sino human dito? Okay. Lahat tayo human. <laughs> Pero sa computer, hindi niya alam. Tama? So I will give you a nice example. Can you please read? I don't know. The number one, the boy leapt from the bank into the cold water. Okay, second. <laughs> the van pulled up outside the bank and three masked men got out. Indeed, there was talk of creating a sperm bank for geniuses. So the word bank here is actually used in three different senses. So first is yung river bank. Ama? Second is bank. And the third is sperm bank, which is actually a, hindi naman pera ang may store, but sperm. Nama? So that's actually uh, why it's extra challenging. Another example, he always wanted to be a Bollywood star. The Milky Way galaxy contains between 200 and 400 billion stars. So the word star there is actually used in two different senses. Star pwede yung mga artista, mga star ng ating life. Nama? Or the second one is actually the hot burning gas na star. Okay? But how can we teach the computer to disambiguate the word star in different contexts? Yan yung ating topic, ang text man. Okay, so ano ba yung makita natin sa text? Of course, in text, there is what we call the meaning. Ano pa? Merong opinion. Okay? Merong ding sentiment. No? Sentiment natin ngayon, happy tayo, pero mainit. Okay, mainit. Because of my costume lang siguro. <laughs> Idea, thought, and done. We can also, of course, get the author's identity. So, balaman ko kung nag-plagiarize. Sino nag-plagiarize dito? Kasi hindi naman, hindi naman siya gato magsulat. Bakit naging ganito ang pagsasulat niya? Nawa? It reveals your identity. Also, there is a message no, that we, are, we want to communicate. 
There's also construct. So ano ba yung mga constructs na alam ninyo? Construct is something that is not tangible. Like for example, honesty. How do you define honesty? Or how do you define morality? Di ba? So maraming mga ganong uh, construct na pwede natin makuha sa text. And of course, emotions or moods. So all of that, no? kung mag-focus kayo sa isang part na yan, then that is actually now text mining. So, bakit tayo favorite natin ang text? Because from the data science perspective, madaming text. So, maraming data. Hindi tayo makihirapan collect ng mga data. No, unlike sa mga baboy-baboy, mahirapan tayo mag-collect ng data. Diba? Tama? Anak-anak at mga lamaw. Mga... <laughs> Mga tai, yeah. di ba? Oy, wala ano, wala offense ka ma'am, no? And then, mag pa ka sa mga tao ng mga laban, no? <laughs> Pero, data, text data is actually very abundant, no? Kahit hindi mo na, hindi ka na mag-interview, pu punta ka lang sa social media, kuha ka lang ng mga ano dyan, email, you have actually data to work for. So, ilang data? 2.2 million new book titles, per year 50 million published scientific journals 500 million tweets per day 8 trillion text messages are sent per year so ngayon ilan na na-send ninyo sa ikayo pa lang today wala okay 55 million status updates this week ilang status update <laughs> na contribute kayo diyan 108 billion emails received per day so ilang emails ang natatanggap niyo every day Dagan kayo. Ang inyong nasend. Wala kayo. Kaya wala hinay ang internet. Okay. <laughs> so consider this, no? In UP Mindanao, how much texts are generated each day? Dito lang sa UP, no? Think of emails, reports, social media posts, etc., etc. So yan yung amount of text na available. And that already provide us an abundant source of data. So ito yung text analytics no. Dito na lang siguro iano yan pero it's just a uh, automatic no. So sinabing automatic hindi manual. Automatic extract or discover minimal patterns in text. We can also use text analytics to associate textual elements to construct constructs. So for example, yung construct about goals, okay or goal setting attitude. So we can associate text that describes that construct. Okay. So ano yung key steps? So hindi um actually the talk will be about the steps. So i ano ko na lang siya. I skip ko na lang kasi I will just discuss this in detail. So ano yung mga application? So una-una web search. Okay? So paano ano ginawa ng Google para meron na siyang ano ready na pag mag-type kayo doon ng ter ah, key terms. Diba? Ano ang ginagawa niya? It actually i-index ang lahat ng mga websites. Then paano niya ginawa yung match? Na hanapin mo doon is COVID. Diba? At ang lumabas is about COVID and not about other things. Because of text analysis. Another one is, of course, we can do a bibli bibliographic information network. No? Yung relationship ng mga authors tsaka papers. And of course, yung Sentiment, no? My boss is great. My boss is taller than me. My boss is horrible. So those are what? Sentiment analysis from text. And of course, itong uh, big, um, literature, automatic author uh, literature review. Okay? So can you think of other applications of text mining? Mag-isip kayo, ano kaya mga application of text mining in your own research? Si Ma'am Diane, meron na siya doon sa kanyang the AI. Okay, so it's your turn. So, punta kayo dyan. Okay. <laughs> okay. Punta kayo dyan, tapos lagay ninyo kung ano yung mga sa tingin ninyo, paano natin magamit yung text mining or text analytics sa inyong resources. Okay. 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 Sa so social research, we can actually do that uh, using social media data, no? Post, may mga 
uh, yung mga social behavior from users online. So, madami tayong makuha dyan. May mga trolls. Ma? Ma-identify natin mga trolls. And of course, yung survey data, usually ginagawa natin Likert style or Likert no? scale. Or, pero meron din open-ended or meron din tayong mga thorough questionnaires. So, yung data na lumalabas sa ating focus group interview can also be a source of text. Okay, so example lang ito no, about last week. And then we have modern technologies using text. So bakit kaya sa tingin ninyo yung maganda yung ating ano, maganda yung ating chat GPT? Because gumamit sila ng napakaraming text na available lang sa internet. No? So hindi na sila nahirapan mag-collect ng data. So kinuha lang yung mga data doon sa internet, pak, lahat and then gumawa sila ng model. Okay? So ang ating mga methodologies, classification, language modeling, speech recognition, caption generation, machine translation, document summarization and question answering. Here we will focus on text classification and document summarization. So ito yung ating well ayaw hindi ko na ano to, hindi ko na siya i-discuss fully because I've already mentioned the internet is actually a abundant source of text data. Hindi lang sa internet, you can also have printed and the text that you wrote no, on paper. Tsaka yung text messages. So ito yung sample text galing sa online. If you're going to extract that, you will actually get this particular um, text. Okay? And then we can pre-process text. So once you have text, it's not enough na analyze agad. Dapat muna nating i-clean ang text. So we are now going to how do we pre-process text? So first is we can remove the punctuations because your punctuations parang hindi naman siya masyado useful. And then of course remove the tags. And then we can remove brackets. So these are punctuations. And then we end up from this text, we get from the internet to this text. Okay, na-remove na natin siya. And then we can also do some more text preprocessing such as what we call sentence segmentation. So these things are done automatically. Okay? So for example, from this paragraph, no, na mga, te, na mga sentences, pwede natin siyang apply ng sentence segmentation para makuha natin yung individual sentences niya. Okay, so yung kanina, analyze study complex systems, so one sentence yeah. So madali lang gawin sa English kasi the English language is, meron tayong mga clues, like kung mag-start sa capital letter and with a period or a punctuation, then most probably they form a sentence. Okay, so ganyan na siya. So once we are done with the uh, extraction of sentences, we can now further do Preprocessing, like remove commas and periods. Kanina, hindi muna natin analyze ang period because import, um, helpful siya to, to extract the sentences. Once, but once na kuha na natin yung individual sentences, pwede na natin i-remove yung period at comma. So, yan na siya. So, ano sa tingin nyo ang next dyan? After natin ma-remove lahat ng punctuation, ang pinakamaganda is pwede na natin siyang itokenize. Okay? So, pag sinabi natin tokenize, we actually getting from paragraph, sentence, to individual words. Okay? So, must be a substarter. So, hindi ko inalis yung dash sa substarter because they form one word lang kasi. Okay? So, must be a substarter. So, marami tayo mga word to tokenizer. So, kayo na bahala mag-search sa internet kung ano yun. And then, we can do what? Lowercase transformation, which means that we remove all the that and remove. We have to convert all capital letters to. Bakit kaya? Di naman siya. Kasi ang computer, pag, pag binasa niyo yung analyze sa ka-analyze, ibang word yan sa kanya. Pag, kasi yung encoding niya ay iba. Pero pareha lang pala. So, mas maganda i-remove siya. Okay? Ay i-convert siya. And then of course what we uh, there is what we call esteeming. Yeah? Esteeming ba pag pronounce? No, esteeming. Ah. <laughs> okay? So ano yung stemming? Remember yung isang word pwede siya maraming maraming uh, form depende sa tense, 
di ba? Sa gender, in some language, and also, ano ba, tense, uh, agreement, yung sa grammar. So, for example, yung word na uh, requirements, di ba halos same lang naman siya sa requirement lang na word. So, pero bakit na ba? Okay, ito pala. Experience, writing, various levels of documents. So, yung word na experience, kasi pwede na experience na may D. So, inalis na lang yung E dyan. So, parang experience na lang. Writing. So, usually yung word na writing, ginagawa lang yan siya na write. Or kung wrote, then write pa rin. And then various, inalis ang S. Level of... So, marami tayong ways to stem. Ang pinakasikat natin is yung porter steaming. Which is possible na na ang makuha mo na word is hindi talaga actual word. Just like experience here. Pero it doesn't matter because a computer, hindi naman niya naintindihan kung ano yung experience na may E o wala. Basta pare-pareha lang siya. Isa lang yan sa tingin ng computer. And then of course, we remove what we call the stop word. So ano ba yung stop words? Yan yung usually mga preposition and articles that they don't add any meaning. No? Mamaya ka. Working in a team environment. Kailan pa ba yung in a? Wala na, di ba? Okay? So, maging working team environment na lang. Okay? So, that's how we pre-process text. So, example, kumbay natin lahat yon. We have analyzed function business application. Maging ganito na lang siya. Analyze function BC applic design specific function active. So, ano ang effect? we actually reduce the number of words na kailangan nating i-deal. Because in some text mining applications, the number of words, the words correspond to your variable. So kung meron kayong text na, let us say, uses 10,000 vocabulary, mayroon pang iba-iba dahil sa tense, then that would be the number of variables or the dimensionality of your data. Okay? So na-reduce natin ang ating dimensionality. So, in fact, ang computer, hindi pa rin niya maintindihan yan. So, what we do is actually transform na natin ang text. From pre-processing, we go now to transformation. So, from this text, applyan natin ng mga pre-processing. Ito na lang, tapos ilagay na lang natin siya as a set. So, analyze, function, BC, applic, design, function, active. And then it now becomes a vector like this. So, paano ito na form? So, this actually is corresponds to how many times yung word na yan nag-occur doon sa, sa sentence. So, analyze. Ilang times siya nag-occur? One lang. Ang function, twice. Di ba? Kasi may functional, tsaka functional. So, two. And then one. So, the from text, naging ano na lang siya? Victor. Di ba? Naging victor na lang siya na yan ang maintindihan ng math Tsaka maintindihan ng computer. Tama. <laughs> Simple lang, di ba? <laughs> okay, so yan na siya. So, tawag natin dyan, oh, pinaka-old ito sa actually, tawag natin is bag of word or multi-set representation. Okay? So, example. So, paano yan ang vector? So, i-define natin siya. Ito yung kanya mga variables, kumbaga components. And then this is now the representation for sentence 1. And this is now the representation to of sentence 2. So naging vector na lang siya. Or kung i-connect-connect mo yan siya, naging data yan siya. Okay? So you can actually represent that. Sino ba dito ang nag-mat 120? Linya algebra. Oh, pwede natin siyang i-represent as a vector na sa ating space. Okay? And then of course the various waiting procedure to some terms. So, yan yung ating summary and these are the... Uh, and then, of course, very important, uh, evaluation that we need to do some validation para yung ating model ay hindi mag-overfit sa ating data. Okay? Okay. Okay, so, let's now go to demonstration na tayo. Okay? Kasi mahirap kung walang puro yo yo lang, di ba? Eh, mo na. Eh, pero tayo natunan kayo. Sige na tagyaw-yaw. So, atoy mo on. 
We will uh, we are going to this is very relevant to you because this study actually I, I did is I want to predict uh, magkano yung magiging in the future given na uh, mayro kayong mga skills na ganito. Pero the catch is I'm using a UK data. So mag OFW mo para <laughs> maano. <laughs> Pero don't worry kasi uh, my team, we will be doing this in the Philippines as well. So we can see no, kung ano ba yung mga skills ang medyo malaki-laki yung bigay. Bio ba? Amat ba? Food tech ba? Or data science ba? Comsai ba? Yung iba, wala naman talagang pera yan. No? <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's go. Background. I live there, ini. Eh, stop ang record. Pakit ka. Okay, pakit ka. <laughs> okay, salary. Oh, tama. Don't, don't forget. Agribusiness. Huh? <laughs> And the rest of the courses. Okay. Salary. So salary is an important concept. Actually, it's studied no not only in uh, in math but also in economics and other <laughs> and other subjects. So so back it important because it's an important uh, concept in labor market research and career research. It's also a very important concept in job mobility, Job success, career success, gender differences, and skills are often studied in relation to salary. So, tingnan ninyo, uh, kung meron kayong mga ano, no, pamangkin or siblings na magka-college pa lang, you can advise them ano ng course. Pag-graduate may pera. At hindi na siya manghingi sa inyo. Okay? So, we will do topic modeling. So, hindi ko na lang i-ano, no, kasi malapit na pa lang time. Anyway, pabasa nyo lang man to. The idea is to use actually topic modeling. So what I did here is I actually use topic modeling. So ang data natin is job vacancies. Yung alam yung mga job posting, job adverts. Di ba usually mayroon sila binabanggit doon na mga salary. So what I did, I applied text mining to relate yung mga skills na na-mention doon sa job vacancy to the salary na ginarequire nila. Okay? So yun yung parang independent tsaka dependent variable ko. Okay, so madali lang siyang gawin kasi meron naman nagpo-post ng mga job vacancy with salary. So ito yung mga topics no na nakuha natin based on our um topic modeling. So tingnan natin, so ito yung mga skills no, data analysis, analysis, care people, workers, so may, maybe 61 is the topic about caregiving. 86 about engineering and 40 is about data analytics. So marami pa yan. Around 100 yata yung kinuha ko. 170. So ito na yung average salary. So organization, pinakamalaki talaga ng mga salary. Yung mga associated term niya ay strategy, develop, case stakeholder, strategic plan, influence, relationship. And these are the different job titles. Head of communication engagement. So Siyempre, high level, mga strategic, of course, malaki talaga ang salary. Bank, no? risk, bank, program, function, investment, so malaki-laki din. Kung gusto nyo naman, meron kayo dito, medyo kaunti lang siya, clean area facility duty use, pwede din, you will still be earning this much. So ito yung top five, highest pay job, hindi mabasa, pero most uh, are related to finance and Um, higher level na organization uh, strategy. And then top associated uh, lowest paid jobs. Ito yung mga lowest paid. Uh, clean area, order, telephone, administration, call center, ability, attention, community. So, ang ating na, ang isa sa mga pinakaano natin dito na observe is yung communication skill is actually belong to a lower pay scale, uh, low, low pay scale. Maybe because Um, need nyo kung baga may mga jobs na nime-mention talaga yung communication skill but hindi masyado malaki yung salary okay but still an important skill okay so saan tayo dito amat ah komsay okay komsay ito nandito kayo oy upper end kayo na. software developer technology so nandyan kayo 
Okay. Yung ano naman, analyst, but, ah, okay, baka mali ito na data. Okay. Okay. Itong mga lowest actually is correspond to mga OJT na job. So, they are not being paid actually. So, kaya lowest. Okay? So, and actual, I also compare it, di ba kailan to i-validate? So, we compare it with a independent source of data. Ito yung survey data naman na ginawa sa UK. And as you can see, it actually corresponds to the words topics na nandiyan. Okay? Anyway, hindi ko na lang siguro to ano, mention. So there are many opportunities for climb text mining your research. Existing domains theory can help improve the outcomes of the text mining process. Meron siyang policy implication in education development. Hindi ko na discuss maybe in some other uh, talks na lang yun. And then of course we are open for collaboration. No, just write me or visit me in the office. Okay, so but before that, siguro ipakita ko muna ang isang example sa sentiment analysis. So it's quite easy now to actually use no, yung mga text files. Kung talaga nito on sa ano sa hugging Hugging face, uh, uh, a hugging face na library, and you can actually get their uh, sentiment. No, if this is just an example provided to that. So, meron, like, so a sentiment is labeling the sentiment whether it's a positive or negative, and it actually gives us a kumbaga, uh, confidence. How confident is the model in saying a positive or negative? So ito yung binigay ko na uh, sa classifier, sabi niya Vladimir is so ugly, I love him. Positive negative. Dili pa sentiment ba sa sentiment. Positive di ba? So na detect siya actually. Ay, ay para na lang nako na para makita ninyo. So le pareha sa taas. So positive ito naman. I hate the subject very much that I, the, uh, that I actually like it. Keep it up. Positive, negative? Positive. No? Subukan natin. Sige, can you give me a sentence? Pinating malagay. Wala. So let's run. Oh, tama. Tama ba? Nainggit mang good siya. So negative. And the food in Manalija's canteen is so so. So, dili kita impress. So imagine what it can do to your business and also what it can do to your um we, we make some survey, no, based on sentiments. We can actually I did not train this. I just get the model from Hugging Face. And there's a lot of models there from summarization, question answering, chat GPT, one model is also there. So you can also use that. So that's it. Thank you. And I hope I was able to inspire you to do text mining. All right. Thank you very much, sir, So for that very interactive no, na presentation. Sana may natutunan yung mga students natin about text mining and text analytics. So, dahil dyan, dito na tayo sa quiz. All right, sige. With a price of many flat tops, depende sa kung ilan yung ibibigay ninyo. Sige, what are some of the applications of text mining? Go. Yeah, sa likod. Ayun, sa likod, may nakita ko. May nag-raise ng hand. Magbigay lang ng kahit na isa lang applications of text mining. Ano yun? 
All right, web search is one. Congratulations. Sige, ilabay na ako sa imo. Okay lang. Si ano pa? Pwede pa isa pa. Yes. Isa pa. All right, sentiment analysis. That's also one. So yun yung pinakita kanina ni Sir no, Ma malalaman natin kung ano yung magiging ano yung sentiment or ano yung mood ng isang text or or a uh, group of words, right? All right. Sige, is reserve na lang ako ni Unya. I-claim na lang sa office ni Ma'am Chin. All right. Um sige. What are some steps? So magbigay lang ng kahit isa lang uh, doon sa text pre-processing. So yes. Kinis ng kamot. <laughs> Yes. Ano yan? All right. So removing stock words. That's one. Hala, daghan na ba? <laughs> si, si, ay, umana ka, umana ka. Si, yes. Dyan Stemming? Okay. Yes, yes, tama. Pila na to? Daghan na kayo to. Dalawa, dalawa na yun. All right. Sige. I-claim na lang on niya, ha? Ah, sige. Sige. One more. One more. Yes. What's that? Okay. Work tokenization. That's also one. All right. Sige. Claim na lang later, guys, ha? Okay. So, now we will begin with the question and answer portion. So, are there any questions regarding Sir Vladimir's topic? Um... Let's have sa students right now. Meron ba tayong mga questions? From the advice, tama ba? What are your sentiments about sir ano? Sige, ano ba yung mga questions? Okay, sige. Um, start muna tayo sa Zoom. Hi, Sir Vlad. This is actually an interesting talk. I am keen to know how we can practically apply text analytics in the context of business wherein we highly consider customer feedback, so which is very important in product services and offerings. Ay, nagpasalam, nag-shoutout lang din siya, sir. Ah, uh, Thank you so much and love your shiny and purple outfit. Wait, lang, saan yung question? Shout out lang siya, no? Okay. Ay, ayan, yung how we can practically apply. Okay. So, paano yun, sir? Okay, so first and uh, foremost, thank you for the compliment. Okay. Um. So, actually, yung napasend ko isa lang siya na text text analysis. So if you can just imagine yung sa mga chatbots, no? So maybe one siguro na encounter niyo na, na you are chatting sa ano sa customer service and then nagre-reply is yung ano yung chat chatbot. So actually isa yan sa application. To make your kumbaga customer feedback or customer service real time without hiring a lot of people, pwede na na chatbots. And you can also do not only for example, yang si Siri, di ba? So you can imagine na uh, you call someone pero nakausap mo pala is uh, computer, no? Computer. So that's also one application. And another is yung sa mga product reviews. If you look at the Amazon, when you order, di ba? Or mag-book kayo ng hotel, you look at the reviews. Di makikita nyo doon sa reviews yung mga positive tsaka negative. And then you can read na ano ba yung mga positive na gusto ng mga customer? Ano ba yung mga negative na gusto nila i-improve? And you can do that without actually reading each of the reviews. No? So automatic na siya. And that actually shapes no, how you would develop, further develop, or improve your product or services. Dito sa call set, di ba? you have questions about some process. So imagine, computer na lang ang sasagot dyan. Yo, mas madali kahit alas 12 ng madaling araw pwede kayo magtanong. Okay, walang magagalit na college sex sa inyo. Okay? 
Thank you. So, ibig sabihin, sir, mare-replace na tayo ng mga robots. Hindi man tayo ma-replace ng robots because we will be uh, forced to re-skill. No? So, if we stay on that, ano lang, siyempre, we will be replaced. But human has a capacity naman to improve. So, you have to re-skill. Meron pa rin, actually, meron pa rin mga human, pero minimal na lang yung kanilang participation. Lalo na kung mag-escalate. Baka iba na yung sinasabi ng chat or ng computer. No? That's the time we can intervene. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very uh, no, uh, interesting question. Um, next, parang may isa pa. Um, what kind of hardware was used to analyze the text or perform text mining on the date? So maraming, ano, maraming uh, models. You don't actually need to purchase no, yung mga hardware na, ano, na high specs. Okay? You can use your own laptop. Kasi kagaya ng ginawa ko doon sa sentiment, I actually just used a, a pre-trained model na. So meron ng someone who trained the model. I'll just use it in my application. So, in terms of deployment, madali na lang siya because may nag-train. But if you want to do training talaga, so you have your own data and you want to train your own model, then you might need a high-spec hardware. So, ano yung mga hardware na yon? It can be a, uh, a computer na mataas yung GPU, capability niya, and of course, yung processor. Okay, and then of course, magbili kayo na ang electric fan or aircon. Kasi mangyari, ma-overheat ang inyong laptop. Okay, because it takes a lot of, ano talaga, energy, um, processing power and energy. It's so expensive. Not only the the computing aspect, but also the uh, to maintain it. So, kailangan temperature, magandang temperature, masira, mga ganon. So, uh, it's a serious ano talaga business but no you don't need to do that to make this work in your own products because marami na mga models na available na pwede nyo magamit. So ibig sabihin sir yung mga advices mo magsu super computer sila. No pressure daw sa mga advices. All right, uh what else? Ayun. Uh, sir, uh, Vladi, this lecture is really helpful, especially that it could help make a standard way of analyzing qualitative data. Sentiment analysis is particularly helpful in gauging public responses to, say, laws and pol policies. Uh, my question is, is there a way we could like know the validity of the result? Uh, same with an analyzing quantitative data wherein we can compare it with a significance level. So do we have a way of validating it? Yes, that's a very nice question. Actually, mayroon akong ano, presentation, part siya ng slides, hindi ko lang siya nabanggit. But as I, what I did no, doon sa salary prediction, so I just used the vacancy data to create a model that can predict salary. But ang ginawa ko din is, meron kasi tayo mga labor surveys, existing labor surveys, that they actually ask people how much you earn. So to put that into, ano, para meron kang confidence on the result, you can... Yo, importante yung word na yun. Triangulate, no? Triangulate the results with other existing data. Okay? And same thing doon sa... Um, same with analyzing the... We can compare the significance level. Meron tayo mga performance measures na ginagamit. So, for example, sa sentiment analysis, we can use uh, accuracy. Okay? Or mga F-score. So, meron tayong mga ganyang uh, performance measures. Even sa question sa, sa question answering, yung mga chatbots, meron din yan sila. I think it's a blue blue score ang term nila doon. And then, as I've said, no, ang, ang text mining is just one technique. No? Content, actually, it's a content analysis technique na qualitative, a quantitative. So marami pang other techniques na pwede ninyong gawin sa inyong text. Kung kakaunti yung text ninyo, around hundreds lang, kagaya kay ma'am, you can do the thematic analysis o yung sa in vivo na ano. So this one is only applicable kung ang data nyo is aabot na siya into millions na. No? Kasi sino ba mababasa ng 1 million na mga text? Wala. Mama? And then marami pa yan sa other qualitative techniques na pwede for small data. Yeah? Good. All right. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, Sir Vladi. So, um, are you ready for the next na presenter natin for today? <laughs> Magbe break pa? Hindi. Padayon lang ta. All right. Okay. So our next presenter, um, he is an associate professor here in UP Mindanao. Uh, he entered the academe in 2011 and now um, uh, his research interests pala are mainly about infectious diseases such as the immune response and epidemics, systems biology, population dynamics, and dynamical systems. So with his expertise in mathematics, science, and research, uh, he published published several ISI cited articles presented both in the local and international stage. So his dissertation culminated in 2020 research paper extinction and uniform persistence real food web with micro loop limiting behavior of population model with parasitic fungi, which bagged an international publication award from the uh, UP system. So the research. Um, that our next presenter will be um, uh, showing now. Uh, Gardner, yes, ayon, the, the International Publication Awards, and most recently, the best research poster in the International Workshop on Mathematical Biology last 2023 in UP Baguio. So please help me welcome our next speaker, Associate Professor Alexis Erich Almoser. What's the clicker? Let me just chat. Good, good. I hear. Okay. See, yes, see, yeah. Am I okay? Am I audible, everyone? Uh, those in the chat, am I audible? Okay, good. So, hello, everyone. <laughs> so, welcome to my uh, no, talk. Um, I will present maybe around 30 minutes current research, and it's quite relevant because. Um, COVID-19 needs no introduction, ba? Right? We have been all in lockdowns. It has affected, it has affected economics, social, uh, social constructs, and the like on a global, uh, on local, global, and national scale. Now, there are many ways we could combat COVID-19, but what I want to focus on is SARS-CoV-2. Class, remember the name well. SARS-CoV-2 is severe, acute. Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. It's also known as the COVID-19 virus. And this one has actually caused the world, the global pandemic that we have already, uh, that we were in, um, although we have already been good times. What I want to focus on is how SARS-CoV-2 infects inside the body. So what happens if you get sick? How will the virus in how will the virus you know, wreak havoc with your systems? And most importantly, how can your uh, no, sorry, how can your body, how can your um, immune cells respond to this infection? And I want to do this with calculus. So my main question is, what can a dynamical system tell us about SARS-CoV-2 infection and immunity? Are you familiar with the words or the phrase dynamical systems? Well, some of you, especially those who are taking uh, ordinary differential equations, may already know this well, but here is uh, what we, how we define it. A dynamical system is a set of mathematical equations where the solutions or functions change the, uh, describe the changing quantities in time. Now, in general, we have several dynamical systems, but usually they're in the form of, or the, of differential equations. Who are taking cal who has taken or are taking calculus right now? Raise your hands. So I can see a majority are taking or are have already taken calculus. So recognize the ones in the left. So you, this dv over dt, what type of what do you call this? What do you call that? The dv over dt. That's the that is the derivative of v with respect to. Now, V is the virus, is the size of the virus population. In other words, how much virus you have in your body. T represents time. So we're talking about modeling the vi the change in the virus population, the, the COVID-19 virus with respect to time. 
And there are a number of models that we could construct or even use. And then from there, because you've learned cal calculus, we can either solve or at least analyze the solutions in order to get some feedback. And the solution, depending on the function V of T, could tell you something about infection and ultimately its outcomes. In other words, we can take the limit of that function as time approaches infinity. So we're interested in the limiting outcome of this model. What will eventually happen? Where will you end up? Will you be sick? Will you be well? Or will you be dead? So here are the relevant questions why we must model immune response. Um, which immune responses make an effective vaccine or support successful dr drug therapy? Did you know that you have a complicated sys a complex system of cells capable of fighting uh, a number of pathogens? Flu, COVID-19, leptospirosis, rabies. Maybe in the future, we might have a vaccine for rabies. And so it would help to identify the relevant parts of the immune responses that could make for an effect effective vaccine and support successful drug therapy. On a larger scale, you could also think about the disease as a system. It's not just because it starts from within and what happens next. You kind of sneeze it and you pass on the transmission to the others. So there are two parts of this disease story. There's the input. There's the infection as well as the transmission. Um, there is a very big question on whether severe infection can impact disease transmission and how. Also, um, we, uh, according to studies on COVID-19, much more modeling has been done on the between host. That's why you now have models that can compute the basic reproduction number. That's why you have models that are now integrated in the decision support systems for health. But on the contrary, we have few in-host models that attempt to accurately describe to replication. Here's my dream. I think there is a need to focus to uh, to model more of the infection part so we can understand more fully the, the, the complicated dynamics of this infection. Hence uh why hence why I was interested in in-host modeling. And also clinical um, clinical studies suggest two, uh, two major factors. One, the first line of defense in immunity called the T cells, note this very well, and also antibodies, which is the subject of developing vaccines. So here is the story of how we got to the model of the immune response to SARS-CoV-2. Pay attention. The very first step was actually to find data. During the early stages of the pandemic, a group of German scientists led by Volpel were able to get some uh, were able to get some clinical data from COVID-19 infected patients in the European setting, and they had immediately published the results first as a preprint and then in Nature. With this available data, there was a need to understand that the there was a need to understand this infection. So immediately, my post supervisor. And my producer, <laughs> um, Esteban, and a well-known mathematician, Jorge Velasco Hernandez, took on this data and built a simple model to describe the dynamics based on available data. However, as much as they have done the simulations, the mathematics, especially the analytic, the analysis is still lacking. This is where we come in. Me... Uh, and me, Esteban, and a colleague from the University Nacional de Litoral in Argentina uh, did also the, uh, analyze the same model and perform stability and bifurcation analysis. So if you can stick around, there's a QR link to the paper at the end. You can ready your mobile phones in order to download this, to, to scan the QR code in order to get a piece of this work, this research. So what is Stability. Um, for those who have taken differential equations, you may know this very well, but because uh, we're because the, I'm speaking in front of many students, especially the first years, um, imagine a ball, a ball that that moves. The motion of the ball describes the behavior of the model. If the ball does not move, that means the behavior is constant. This is where you are in an equilibrium point. Stability talks about behaviors near an equilibrium point. In other words, what would happen if you nudge the ball a bit? So at, on one hand, you could nudge the ball from the top and the ball will, what will happen? 
it will fall. It will dislocate to a different location. This is, an un, this is the case of the unstable equilibrium point. But the model frequently favors the asymptotically stable equilibrium point where even just a simple nudge will make the model return back to its initial state. In other words, uh, in the in the long run, you can see the values of the state, the values of the solution will tend towards this asymptotically stable equilibrium point. Now, just imagine if this equilibrium point were b equals zero, that means the limit is going to approach zero, and that will be good news. Or b could be a positive, and that means the limit of your solution with v star will approach that positive v star and that would give you up <laughs> that would be bad news you're eventually going to have viruses inside your body for a long time the stability of a model is key to identifying long-term outcomes according to different parameters it also identifies the changes in behavior otherwise known as bifurcation and based on the um, changes in behavior, we can then identify things like factors for infection or against infection. So this should give you clues as to how you can combat COVID-19. Look at the factors for infection and that can, and for us, can also identify testable scenarios. So where does the model come in? Well, like I said, COVID-19 immune response is already a complicated matter. You're not just dealing with uh, things like, this, like the epithelial cells, uh, the mucous membrane, but you also, have front, you also have front lines like the T cells as well as antibodies. However, we mathematicians like to start simple. So let us just talk about a tale of two characters. You have T cells. These are the front line defense. This is your front line defense who will attack SARS-CoV-2. Now, it is reasonable to liken this kind of interaction with that of a fox and a rabbit. What does the fox do to the rabbit? Fox eats rabbit. Similarly, T-cell attacks SARS-CoV-2. And the good news is predator-prey theory offers a lot of population models that we can adapt into our own problem. So, we adopted one such problem and this came and so we have this simple mathematical model describing the interaction between the f factor t cells the frontline immune response and sars-cov-2 that is the virus causing covid-19 by the way this is the very same model that hernandez vargas and velasco hernandez did and where we also do our analysis so what are the results that we have made? Um, in a nutshell, the result, the, um, the, the, the entire behavior of the model rests within this lambda. So let me look at, let me go back again to this slide. So if you notice that there are e each of these terms are colored. So each term can actually increase or decrease the derivative of, say, the virus or the, or the T cells. That means, for example, this red term called replication it will actually promote the growth of the viruses. However, elimination by T cells and other responses, the ones that I'm encircling right over here, will actually inhibit the growth. So you can see that there's some sort of balance between, on the one hand, the replication of the virus colored red and the elimination by the immune responses colored yellow and green. This is important because the parameters contained within the SARS-CoV-2 equation are actually what drive the dynamics based on a quantity that I would like to call the viral fitness parameter. As the name suggests, the, vir the, la the value of lambda will tell you whether the virus is going to succeed in the infection or it will get eliminated by the, the T cells. So stability analysis allows us to obtain two main results. First, we have the virus-free equilibrium point. Virus-free meaning walang virus. That means V is equal to zero. So we see that this virus-free equilibrium point is locally asymptotically stable for lambda less than zero. That means the model will the model will actually approach the state where V is equal to zero. And so what will happen if now the virus will actually decrease to zero? What would you what would you think? Dubai, you're going to recover because eventually walang virus but it will become an unstable saddle otherwise when lambda is greater than zero, meaning maka-atras yung virus, maka-increase na siya. 
But we also, and what happens at the same time when lambda is greater than zero? It turns out that this is precisely where the other equilibrium point, the virus positive equilibrium point, will emerge. That is when both B and C would be zero. In other words, meta kanang virus eventually. So this will actually exist if and only if lambda is greater than zero. So if we put two and two together, like the lambda less greater than zero is going to talk about the unstable saddle for the virus free and the stability of the virus positive equilibrium point, then we have determined that the T cells and the other immune responses could outpace the viral infection to control infection. In other words, what would you need to do in order to call, to get well? You need a well-performing T cell and other immune responses that will outpace the viral replication. That's the good news. However, if you have things like an, a variant of COVID-19 that where the virus multiplies, so, then that would be bad news for you. Now, this is all news and mathematics. This is all words and mathematics, but a picture can tell you a thousand words, right? Do, don't you agree? You know what's better than one pi uh, one picture? Two. <laughs> Two pictures. Let me, um, the one on the left is what you call a bifurcation diagram. For every value of lambda, the viral fitness parameter, you can keep track of the of the core of the viral loads or the equilibrium values of the viral loads. So for example, when lambda is less than zero, only one branch emerges. That is the virus free equilibrium point. Yung V is equal to zero. And this one is the stable part. That means uh, this corresponds to the graph on the right for the viral load. Notice that it maka decrease na siya, hang tun magiging zero na siya, di ba? So that means the immunity has successfully cleared the virus. Good news. But here is the bad news. Notice that when lambda crosses zero, we now have this case over here. The virus increases to a positive size. And do note that lambda should be just a little bit above zero in order for this kind of behavior to emerge. That is to say that as long as you have, say, just a mild infection, then you, are, you will have the viruses, but it's not going to be as severe as what will come next. You see, what happens is when the lambda actually crosses a value which is very near zero, this happens, severe infection. So notice now that when you just let the lambda be a slightly above zero, the positive equilibrium viral load would dramatically increase, dramatically increase until it reaches this point. Coincidentally, this corresponds to fluctuations of the virus. Now, you might wonder, Professor, this is because of the particular behavior of this equilibrium point, which is thanks to, which can be obtained using the standard methods of stability analysis. So you can see now that Depending on the lambda, you can have immunity clearance. A mild infection would give you this incre monotone increase to positive size. And this particular case of a severe infection, at least this is what our model is talking about. But now that I have said this, an open problem is, should we incorporate the other factors? So to summarize, you can, you can construct as an equation using the language of calculus to create a simple dynamical system that can model immune responses, not just for SARS-CoV-2, but influenza or HIV. Current is being done, by the way, on HIV, and we're also looking at the influenza as well. Stability reveals the role of T-cell response in regulating stability replication. So you can see that by determining the values of lambda, you can say something about the eventual outcomes. Link the parameters to the eventual outcomes, and you get an idea of how you can control the viral infection, which is qualitative, which is a qualitative indicator for successful um, disease control. Also, bifurcation can tell you three possible outcomes to the infection. The immune response can clear, and you're well. You can have persistence, and that would lead to a disease, and you have an even more severe case. Persistence with high viral peaks and low cases. So you might you might imagine why at some point you would be very ill and then you would be very okay. But our story is not yet over. 
to paraphrase Kurus Gesak, our immune system is already made up of a, com a complex full of combating the virus. However, with new data from antibodies, we should upgrade the model. So the question is, can we incorporate antibodies, which is badly needed if we want to talk about personalized treatment and vaccines? So we later did a we later did analysis incorporating antibody dynamics of severe and non-severe patients with COVID-19. But like the story before, it lacks a mathematical analysis. This is the current work that I'm doing here in the department. And if things go well, we're, I will be off to Korea to report on these results. So here's the QR code. Um, if you want to learn more about the paper, please read Stability Analysis COVID-19 with an in-host model with immune response. Daghan salamat po. Thank you very much, sir, sa parang refresher natin sa calculus. No? So yung mga students dyan na nagka-calculus, may quiz bukas. De joke lang. All right, so... Um, Sige, let's have another quiz for Sir Alex's talk. Sige. Sige, first question. What comprises equations whose solution describe changing quantities over time? Anong ta? Yeah, ay. Manamang ka. Let's go. Yes. Okay, it's dynamical systems. So, pakisalo lang. Okay, next. Sige, ito. Maganda to. Kailangan ko yung ano, exact answer talaga, ha? So, what is the full name of the virus COVID-19? Yes. Full name, ha? Full name. Dili ko kusugot o ka ng acronym lang. But full name. Okay. So that's Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Lili man. Wala siya appeal reserve sa conscript. Okay. Ay, isa na to. Sige. Um, name one of the three factors in the integrated in the viral fitness parameters. Hala, wala na. Lambda. Lambda. Uh -oh. Ano yung mga factors there? Yes, sir. Lambda equals zero. <laughs> Mali. O saan ka tong mga ano mismo? Katong... Tong da, tong mga factors involved. Yes, yes. Okay, that's viral replication. Yes. Okay, elimination by T cells. Ah, oh, pa, sige. Okay, so elimination by other immune responses. Pwede, listening jud ka ayo sila. All right. So, okay, so, ano ba yung main na model that describes the predator-prey uh, interaction? So, ano yung dalawa? Anong interaction ng dalawang stuff doon? Box and rabbit. What's that? Ay, oh, yung, yung box, yung nasa model mismo. What's that, sir? Volterra, Volterra equation. Ha, dili. Ang katong mismong dalawang. <laughs> katong dalawang na ano objects na nag interact na to. Yes, Jarlin. De, unsa to sila? Unsa to sila ang katong predator and prey ni mo? Okay, sige. Si kamutan na ni ha? Labay na lang naon. So it's T-cells and the SARS-CoV-2 na virus. All right. So now let's entertain questions, no? From uh Zoom. Oh, 
Okay, sige, may mga questions ba galing sa students natin? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. A very interesting talk, uh, Doc Alex. A question ko lang is, I understand na sa individual siya, di ba? Na I mean, sa individual siya na na analysis. Pero, di ba, na may mga cases na pareha o mga okay ah uh, bro katong mga condition pero na matay ana ma consider dira ang characteristic sa individual mismo or sa thesis lang jud siya og okay so we are um so the question is uh, you're talking about whether this would ano apply to a specific per person aside from uh t cells no or tama ba Ah, okay, okay. I'll try. Ah, ah, yes, yes. I see, I see. That's a very good question because, uh, no, um, in our, our ongoing, in our um current work, we have we are considering also the antibody responses. Because that model, the, the the what uh the model did not incorporate antibodies, which makes sense if the data also did not have the antibody data, but later data also. Had uh later you know, later experiments or later you know, laboratory samples was able to extract was able to tell us something about the antibodies and when you have new variables you have to incorporate it into the model so it we um T cells would not be just be the only factor in the COVID nineteen story there's also the case of antibodies which is relevant especially now that we talk about COVID nineteen vaccines. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, sir. So, um, how about the students? May mga tanong ba yung mga students natin? Yes. <laughs> ano yun? Baka, 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 ano, baka pwede yun ang question kasi. 20,000. Eh. Ah, yes. Yes, sir. Sir, is that? Ayan. Sir, you mentioned two theorems, right? Theorem 1 and theorem 2 in your presentation. Uh, did you provide a proof on the paper itself on both theorems? Um, there. Um, our paper provides the proof of both theorems. This is just a re report on the, you uh, know, the main results in the interest of time. But um, maybe I can say something about, you uh, know, theorem one and theorem two. Um, to establish before we can even establish these results, we have to first find the equilibrium. Uh, to find the equilibrium points. That means also to set the derivatives to zero and then solving the uh, corresponding algebraic system. Now that already a challenge. Now once we have done that, we say we compute for the Jacobian matrices and then get the eigenvalues. It is the nature of these eigenvalues that led us to this result. In fact, one such eigenvalue is the parameter lambda. So you mga naglinear algebra jan. Okay. Um. So wala na bang mga questions? Wala na sir. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for that talk. And now we will proceed um, with our final uh, final pasabog for today. No? Our last presenter. He is an associate professor here in UP Mindanao, also a product here in UP Mindanao with the BS Applied Mathematics degree. Uh, he earned his PhD at the Mathematical Sciences Institute at the Australian National University. Um, uh, he he also is um, he was a cum laude in BS Applied Mathematics here, and 
he also got um, his graduate degree in applied mathematics in UP Diliman. So, sa applied mathematics, si sir na talaga yung pinaka sa pinaka. Ganun. So, as a math mathematician, his interests are primarily about inverse problems and regularization. Um, one of his notable publications, such as the article, A Revisit, Revisit on Land Weber Iteration. So, this deals with solving ill post inverse problems without any information about the noise in the data. So, um, he still continues the work here kasi maraming mga open problems um, that are applied in this particular uh, research area. So, help me welcome our last presenter, uh, Associate Professor Romel Rial. Hello. Uh, uh, um, hello, my name is Romel Di. Um, so again, um, the last speaker, so yeah, uh, thank you for sticking around. Um, so we come a long way from from swines to text to COVID, and now you'll see where are we heading after. So hey, um, um, uh, my talk is not really about like a particular specific research that I did. It's more about the topic that I do and what I sort of have done and what I'm trying to still do up, up to this point. But I want to start with a very important uh, application of this research and that go deals with X-rays uh, imaging. Um, of course, probably you've seen this one. So you might have experience um, getting an X-ray of any part of your body. So how does X-ray work? So you have a source of the X-ray, think of it as like a source, and then you, it, you throw it to any part of your body and then you have some sort of camera that receives that that x-ray and then it reconstructs uh, an image exactly that's our the human uh, uh, the the eyesight works essentially the if there's if there's an organ in our body that that's really the best in match that's our eyes it's essentially the same idea here so here um tomography is also known as x-ray slice imaging so the idea here is for example, in this machine this is an, uh, an x-ray machine you go inside they say you need a scan of your brains so what happens is here inside the brain, um, there are some uh, some source. There's some um, X-rays being thrown at some selected parts of, let's say, a section of your brain, and then it's being captured by another part there, and then that that's being recorded and it's being seen in the monitor there that gives us a brain scan, or in technical terms, it's called a tomograph. Tomograph it, technically it means imaging by sectioning, but now I'm going to um, uh, there are many ways to throw x-ray on your body, you know, there are many ways, uh, let's go to that. But here I'm going to use a particular type of uh, imaging, which is essentially sliced imaging. So how does it work? So instead of just throwing like in a linear direction, you're trying to throw an uh, x-ray in like a slice. Imagine if this is your brain, then you throw uh, you throw this uh, x-ray here, and then you get, uh, oh no, it, it's broken. So so here, so it's an x-ray slice imaging, so that's why it's a, so tomography means like imaging by slicing. You, you throw through a slice and then you get an example here is a 2D slice of a human head. So as you can see, you see some, the eyes, you see the skull, and that's over the belt below, that's the brain. The white part there, essentially the tissues there. And of course, um, of course, X-ray images are like life-saving. It's a groundbreaking discovery in medical imaging. Like here's an example here. You have two types of brain scans with two different types of strokes. In the left, you have ischemic stroke. In ischemic stroke, that it happens when one, one section of your brain has very limited blood flow because there's something is blocking on it. That's why there's a dark part. In the, I'm going to point there. So, sure. Okay, one I can eat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think. Oh, nice piece of technology um here so so that's when a dark part there is. so here there's well, I blood flow and the guts guy something is blocking it in the right this is the hemorrhagic stroke it's different because that means uh, an artery of the brain is bleeding that's why there's a white part there which is uh the blood clot so these two types of strokes um they have their symptoms are very similar but as you can see they are totally different happening here so it's not enough that you just uh, that you just know the symptoms, but 
But with imaging, you, it allows us to see what actually happened inside the brain because these different type of strokes require different medications. For instance, here for ischemic strokes, since naga constrain ang naga walay walay nagagas na brain na sorry, na blood somewhere there. So the medication should actually at the purpose of removing whatever is blocking the blood from flowing. Or the other hand, on a hemorrhagic stroke, it's a different. You have to do something to stop the bleeding. And that is very important here. So doctors, uh, with um, images like this and extra images, uh, doctors can provide the proper medication, especially with ischemic stroke, which requires like more immediate um, attention than this one. Because if this if the, the brain is not solved within minutes, then that part of the brain may not be saved, which can can so we can which we can do. able to get uh, X-ray imaging. It's by the first uh, CT scan invented was. Back in 1979, by uh, Garfield Hounsfield and Alan McLeod, and they developed this X ray tomography machine, this is, which is quite similar to the first image that we've seen. So you go inside, the, you put any, any object inside, and then this, this CT scans, CT short, short for computerized tomography. So it turns around, it turns around because in every time it turns, the X ray turns around, it goes to a section, it, turn, it throws um, some X ray, and then it gets. And then it reconstructs whatever the X-ray passed through, let's say a brain. So this was work, the, of course this work earned them a Nobel Prize in 1979. So these two are, um, uh, are engineers who try to develop this one. So back then they were just like trying to verify that it's a good image using uh, experiment. So they were just hoping that it's actually the best reconstruct the, or the best brain scan that they can actually get. But on the other hand, the mathematics behind this one was already established back in 1917, uh, thanks to the Austrian. So, never heard of it. So, so here's how it works. So this is all nice, you know, groundbreaking results, you know. Everyone could be, you could save life. So here's how. It's line integrals, which is actually shown by this one. And this um, equation here is very, uh, very popularly known as the Radon transform. And the Radon transform is the building blocks of all the tomography um, uh, technology out there beyond X-rays. And you can actually show that it's actually can be shown as uh, can, can be but can be done by using some sort of a uh, logarithmic. Uh, uh, transformation. So if someone asks you where do we use logarithms in real life, use one. If someone asks you, you know where to use it. So, okay, next. Okay, so next. Okay, next. okay so, so here, no, so, so, to say, so that's a uh, zootomo. So there are other ways to use. Uh, tomography, you know, but of course the problem with X-ray is quite invasive. Every time uh, an X-ray is thrown into your body, some uh, cells actually die. You know, of course that's sad. And then, of course, a uh, more um, a more uh, re a revolutionizing way of getting a brain scan here is what we call, uh, which actually is something that I worked on, but not the actual technology, but just the, but the maths behind it. And that's what we call the electrical impedance tomography. 
which is still tomography, but instead of X-ray, we use some very fine electric current. Very fine that you won't even feel it, you know. So here, it's a non-invasive medical imaging, unlike X-ray. So when you use electric, electrical currents, no, it, it's very fine. So uh, you, you won't elect get electrocuted. Okay, don't worry. So here, so here, what happens here is that electrical conductivity and impedance of a body part is inferred from the surface electrode measurements. Think of something like this. Here's an example of a EIT of a human thorax. Do you know where's the thorax? Anyone? Where's the thorax? So that's as a throat. Um, yeah, okay. Just just making sure. So, so it's a thorax. So the idea here is when an electric curve from a source it passes through some particular cell of a thorax, there is some sort of um changes in the electrical current. And that changes can be recorded by uh, another receiver. So given the how much of that tissue actually the electric current passed through, you can actually recover the, the electrical conductivity of this, that, of this part here. And from that, when you, once you know the electrical con conductivity, you will be able to learn what sort of um, organ did it pass. Is it like for a thorax and some, or something else? And different parts of the body have different um, sorts of conductivity, okay? And, so how did we get through this idea of uh, tomography? And in fact, the first EIT was back in uh, around the late 70s, but the uh, mathematical formulation uh, of that was actually laid, laid not, not too long ago, but not too long ago, but way back in 1980 by this uh, Argentine mathematician, uh, Alberto Calderon. In fact, um, the problem of electrical impedance tomography is also known as Calderon flip, which is the problem of recovering conductivity from surface measurements. And yeah, actually show that it's a very severe ill post problem. Okay. What is an ill post problem? I mean, we'll go to that later on. So the cool thing about Calderon is he, he actually studied in university. He actually was supposed to take mathematics, but his father persuaded him to take up engineering instead because uh, his, his father said he will not get a job from a mathematics degree. Of course, that's not true. And then, so again, after he graduated engineering, he wor worked in a petroleum company. So here, so this is the I, so this is the sort of math that he did. The idea is he applied these ideas on EIT originally in, in geological under uh, probing. Let's say if you want to, how, suppose you want to check if there is a petroleum beneath the ground. So the, the idea was to position at some section of an area where you suspect there's electricity, and then you apply some electric current. And we know that when electric passes through petroleum, it changes. It changes the behavior. And those changes are recorded by the measurements here at the boundary measurement. So the idea here, in fact, the very idea of EIT is you want to know what's actually inside by just taking measurements along the boundary. So no digging required here. Of course, before you dig, of course, you have to check if there is a petroleum. So of course, Calderon, while working at the the petroleum company. He um, he was he encountered he he collaborated with a lot of mathematicians. And after some time, the petroleum company he worked, or rather he worked in a university and eventually did a PhD in mathematics. So and that's why he spent most of his lifetime um, working on this problem called the Calderon's problem. And because EIT is non-invasive, it's also good in using, let's say, monitoring the breathing of this uh, ten-year-old baby. Uh, oh, sorry, 10 month old baby. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, joke lang. <laughs> they have a 10 month old baby. So here, notice kini mga, ni, kini mga patches. These are like very fine electrical something. Though, electrical, so the baby won't even feel it. No? So here, in the left side, so you have this reconstruction of the lung. And here, they're trying to monitor the lung of a 10 month old baby while breathing. And no. Oh, yeah, yeah, something like that. Then, then, and also from this one, you have this uh, graph here, which is like the the relative impedance change. So 
this simply gives a monitor you know, on how how the lung reacts. Of course, it has, a, you know, it has an increasing decreasing because it's breathing. So you have inhale and then exhale. When we inhale, the impedance or of the lungs or its ability to resist um, electric current increases compared when it you're exhaling. So uh, ano. And then from the breathing and the lungs, you can actually monitor if the how is the breathing of the baby. Okay. So those are the applications of the, the things that we did here in a uh, tomography. So as I mentioned, we're talking about the inverse problem. It's an inverse problem because we we know mainly or the more the more well studied counterpart is the direct problem. So it's like you have given the cause, you have to uh, determine the result. It's like something like in modeling, let's say in the in COVID nineteen. So you want to forecast the let's say the number of cases and say in the next week. So you have these parameters of the model. You you give a predicted uh, number of cases. The inverse problem is the other way around. So it's from the observed effect. You want to determine the causes. So it's like in the EIT. So you're using the causes of what caused the measurements on the boundary. You want to find out what what is inside that actually caused those changes when you recorded them at the boundary. And a more effective way to distinguish the two is what we call ill postness. So what is an ill post problem is a definition. So first, let's first define what is a well post problem. Uh, problem is well post. Avoid. This is the only definition I'll show in the class. So yeah, yeah. I've heard my, some my students have had a lot of definitions, which is cool. Okay. A problem is well posed in Hadamard sense if uh, it satisfies three things. First, the problem has a solution that's existence. It has a unique solution. And also, the solution depends continuously on the data. Now, the third one is more intricate. That means if there are small changes in our data, then there should only be also small changes in the solution. It cannot be the, uh, not, uh, different, like you have small changes in the data, you have uh, large changes in the solution. If that's the case, you have an ill post problems. And the EIT is an ill post problem. We're not going deep why it's ill post, but to solve the ill post problem, of course, we need to apply some computational methods to solve that one. This is the method that allows us to reconstruct the atomograph of, let's say, um, let's say in an X, same with X ray tomography or in EIT or in the petroleum uh, engineering, and that's what we call regularization. Probably if you've done some machine learning or statistics, um, probably you've heard of the term regularization. In fact, I first heard of regularization when I was um, doing a course on uh, machine learning because you know uh, after graduation from college, I was too bored, so I tried to learn machine learning. I yeah. have so much time, guys. Okay, so in regularization, what you do with the regularization, so you have an impulse problem, how do you solve it? You try to approximate it by a family of well-posed problems. And well-posed problems, of course, if a problem is well-posed, that means it's possible to approximate the solution. Not if, You don't even have to solve it exactly because in some instances it may be impossible, but when you try to appro approximate the solution of the problem because it's well-posed, we are sure that it's a good approximation. Same as in tomography, if you're just if you're just like small changes in like your data and the boundary, then you can get can show that the tomograph that you actually get is somewhat good. Okay. So here, so of course I won't go deep. So here, so there are two types of uh, regularization methods I actually studied. So you have a uh, thick one of regularization. People doing machine learning know this uh switch regression, which is just something like uh which, like, which we can form it as an optimization problem like this. And normally we can um Describe ill post problems to be an ill post linear equation. When you pose a linear equation, that means it's a linear equation whose coefficient matrix has a very large uh, condition number. Hope you remember what's a, if you haven't heard of condition number, that's okay. You can, can, uh, can, you might learn it a bit later on. And also, so there are two issues here you know, on applying regularize, uh, regularization methods. So there are two things. First, the computational effort that you need some regular, because we are dealing with very large types of data. So you have to um, devise some methods that can be actually used and can give you 
uh, solution in a reasonable amount of time, regardless of how large the data is. And images are examples of data that are really large because they take a lot of pixels in order to capture the, the whatever it, it tries to capture very well. So these are just two things that I've studied. Tikkunav is uh, it's actually good, but the problem is it's computationally intensive. Uh, iterative methods like this one, it solves this ill post least squares problem, which is of this form. And in fact, the lab web iteration is nothing but a gradient method, something like this. And also, there are also other promising methods that also actually um, combine the good things of these two types of classes of uh, methods. Um, so again, a regularization is a very uh, rich type of um, uh, uh, research. There's so much that we can do. And to, it, to demonstrate how our regularization works, so kindly, and uh, so, let, so let's try to click that image, which I will show a short video. Okay, so just open it. So no, it's a very, it has no sounds, okay. Okay, so here um, in the left, that's suppose that's the exact image that you want to counter. Think of it like an exact brain scan. And then on the left side are these approximations of the image on the left. So in a regularization, it does, it gives you a sequence of images that tries to approximate this exact image. And you want to see that as more approximation that you get, this must actually get resemble closer to this exact image. So notice it changes. So notice if you look at this white spot here, it's um, in count, uh, reconstructed here. So notice an image has like some important details, like for instance, in a brain scan, think of it like a, a region of particular interest, example, like an artery or a tumor. And notice that as time goes by, notice that the image on the right it resembles the this image on the left, but because it's ill post, uh, we have things get interesting because notice as we wait a little bit away, this will just be like less than two minutes. So here, so as you can see here, notice uh image uh, it somewhat gets. Uh, it sort of gets, uh, although the case claro, but the idea here is that it sort of gets, suddenly it gets far from the exact image that we actually want to get. And that's the nature of an ill post problem. So therefore, if, when you have a regularization scheme, you have to make sure that if you're going to uh, implement it, it will give you the uh, very um, accurate uh, reconstruction. And there is so much analysis that we can do from there. And okay, now please. Okay, so, so so a little so some of the research areas under regularization, of course, you have this one. You have, suppose uh, you have a solution with some important properties, and also when you have some observed data, let's say your data is only captured in one instant. What if you have some experimental type of data where you update your data from time to time, and also how do you guarantee th that your regularization method will actually give a nice an accurate solution. Okay, so how does uh, the study of regularization work? So the theory is growing, it's developing, and the idea is you want to cover a large type of inverse problems, whether they are problems on a medical imaging or in petroleum engineering or sort of. Notice these are two different realms, but just governed by the same laws of mathematics. So here, uh, the research on um, also, the, re the research in regular ratio is somewhat an application of like analysis or uh, calculus, advanced calculus or real analysis, and also, of course, of uh, numerical optimization. So, in this research, there's an interplay between the theory, that's where the proofs come in, and the numerics, because you have to illustrate that the results in the theory works by some numerical experiment, and that's where the numerical implementation uh, comes in. And here, so of course, the challenges from regularization is you have this data, okay? So you have you reserve a survey data, let's say from a, suppose you're in NASA and then you, you have a satellite lying in outer space and it sends you some image of, let's say, an asteroid. And normally, because some errors in the data transmission, it won't really come in very perfect. It would look like this on letter B. And this is, a, suppose, it's the original image. This is an observed image, and this is an image, it's probably one of the worst types of noise that you can get from the image, and this is what we call a 
salt and pepper noise because it's like you sprinkle salt and pepper on an image. And this happens when, because you have an image, it contains a lot of pixels. And suppose it gets noisy at any random location and on any random pixel, it gets noisy. So it's hard to describe it by some uh, probability distribution. So you have to be more, to get deeper in deciding which, how do you actually get the nice image here? And the idea in regularization is that you will not really get an exact image, you will only, but, but you will only get something close to that exact image. And what's, and what's nice also is, uh, and what's also worse is you solve a problem and don't really, you don't actually don't know what, if it's actually the exact solution you're working on. Because in mathematics, you, know, you, can, you can just assume that the solution exists and that's it, you know, you, you don't have to check, solve what, what is actually the solution. But in most problems, that's good enough to solve it. And you got a solution and of course, mathematically, you can prove that, yeah, this is actually the best image that I can actually get under some circumstances. And this is a photo from some recent paper that I did. So some parting thoughts now. So we've come a long way, you know, from swines to text analysis to COVID. And of course, now as time goes by, you know, we, the problems around us evolve. In fact, new, in, new types of inverse problems are emerging and they are all driven by applications that say in natural language processing, in systems biology, engineering, and also in uh, finance. And, of, and that's why it's a, it, it's a must that we need to study deeper in, in these methods. No, you cannot just go out there and then apply the algorithm and hope it works, right? You have to study the maths uh, behind it because here regularization of course needs to catch up theoretically to cover a wider class of inverse problems and of course uh, studying the mathematics and actually unlock us the hidden properties on how to actually deal with that problem on how to overcome and it's po ill postness and when we understand the mathematics of this problem this will lead us to algorithms hopefully better algorithms that than, than uh, the ones we know, it's like in uh, medical imaging, where suppose you have this gut image, and of course you want, if you want to do better, like for instance, you want to get an image that is actually more detailed than possible, and how do you change your algorithm? Maybe you were missing some uh, important assumptions that's not, we're not getting the type of image that we actually want. And of course, it's very important to do the mathematics of these types of problems, because as we've seen earlier, mathematics saves lives. Okay? So that ends for the talk. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Moraglami lang mong kape, sir. Okay. So, um, sige, mag questions. Questions tayo regarding sa talk ni sir. Okay. <laughs> Rob said. Sige, what is the what do you call the X-ray technique or method in producing 3D images? Yes, we got a bit. Okay, tomography. Dahil jan, muragdagan na yung kag talo na yung chocolate. Sige. All right. Sige. Next. Um, anun tawag don sa integral transform na pinahita ni sir uh, regarding. Asige, yes. All right, it's the rate of transform. Pede na sir, no? Pede na. <laughs> okay, last. Um, this is the approximation of an ill post problem by a family of well posed problems. Yes. Okay, it's regularization. Ayan. So, pwede na, no, mga applied math students. So, mga applied math students, maka-encounter po mo, Ani. Okay, so, um, let's have this moment, no, for the the question, uh, questions. Uh, meron ba sa... Okay, how about sa students? Uh, are there any questions regarding um, Sir Romel's topic? Yes, Sir Vladimir. Thank you for that, uh... 
very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Roman. I would like to ask if you have some ideas of how we can uh, apply this in uh, machine learning. Because I see a lot of potentials and maybe we can also accept a few uh, uh, be, uh, species students to work on uh, this type of problems. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I think the one thing that find that comes into mind right away is you know, how to fine tune the parameter that we use in machine learning. Of course, the reliability, the accuracy of the solution that we get on the machine learning algorithms, you no, know, relies on the parameters that we use. And often we don't, some actually don't try to like go deep on how do we choose these parameters, and that's actually where regularization can come in. On how do you choose that, those parameters? Okay. So, my collab, sir, regarding sa ano? Yes, I believe because uh, uh, machine learning is basically you have the data, and what you see is the data, and the goal really is to uh, fit a uh, model or a cur uh, curve for that data. So, and we always expect that sa data na ajay noise, no, because my errors, sources of errors. So I think really it's uh, so I, I I offer this as a challenge no sa mga amat that's really an interesting problem and a lot of potential in this is kaya lang need lang judi lang uh, how sila mag analyze only the best yes by invitation <laughs> so kaya yung advice mo sir is the best tama di ba <laughs> All right, so um, just an information we would like to announce uh, that there will be a free seminar. Sino ba dito gusto ng free? Free seminar with free pizza. Nakalagay talaga dito with free pizza as well. Ito da yung highlight sa kanilang seminar. Um, this will be on March 25 at Lorenzo Hall. From 8.30 a.m. to 11.00 11 a.m. So um, this is about the emerging technologies focusing on blockchain, Web3, and NFTs. So kung sino yung gustong yumaman, pumunta tayo doon. O, diba? So that will, again, that will be on March 25 at Lorenzo Hall, 8.30 to 11 a.m. So uh, kindly keep posted on the DMPCS page. I hope that uh, I hope na na follow nyo yung uh, DMPCS page and the University of the Philippines Mindanao page. Um, a lot of the announcements there are posted. So um, kindly be updated there. Okay. So um, wala na pang pahabol na questions sa students naman. Basic sa mga ano sa mga applied math, especially sa applied math. May mga questions ba? Wala na? Alright, so since wala na, thank you very much, sir, for that talk. Um, I would like to invite once again yung mga speakers natin for ano, um, picture-taking lang. Pero wala na si Ma'am Dayan eh, kasi nag pa siya. Okay, so uh, picture-taking lang muna tayo mga speakers here. Ah, uh, ma'am, dito sa gitna. Sir, ayo i atabo ng ano. Diri, ay, diri ang uban. Ay, diri ka, ma'am, diri ka, ma'am. Photo lang, sir. All right, thank you very much to our speakers. And uh, before we finally end, um, I, sir, may pahabol pa pala na question, sir. Yes. Sino ang? I didn't have entertain, sir. Sayang naman, nag-effort mo na. Ayun. Ayan. 
Sige, sir, can we apply this to satellite images? Are there thresholds you've set that the problem is already solved? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, definitely, um, there's a lot of inverse problems on uh, uh, satellite images. I imagine you have these imaging techniques on uh, X-ray and EIT. Most likely, the one in satellite images, they're all governed by the same maths, essentially. And of course, no, there are also some works on dealing with inverse problems on satellite imaging, although I'm not that involved on that, although I'd love to get involved. Oh, and also, how do you set that the problem is already solved? Oh, that's a good question. And that's where regularization comes in. Uh, regular, regular, uh, regularization also tells you that if you have this approximate solution, do we accept it? And that's also, and there are rules to, um, that we can use to check if the regularization is solved. Let's say if the regularization method, if the regularization method has said, oh, this is already good enough, then you take it. Why? Because when you solve another solution, you will end up with something that is actually worse. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, now um, uh, we are now ending our program. So before that, um, let me welcome the department chair of DMPCS, Doc Chinmay Manligas Garillos, for the closing remarks. Thank you, Sir Ken. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for the box office hit of the DMPCS lecture series. Palakpakan nyo naman ang inyong mga selves no, for your participation. So I hope no, that uh, as of this time, no, yung mga brain cells nyo ay hindi natamaan ng x-ray. May natamaan ba ng x-ray na brain cells dito? No? Your, your brain cells uh, are stimulated no, rather. So... I hope that uh, you have learned uh, from the the insights, the results that were shared by our dear faculty members, no, and that you find uh, those insights applicable to your thesis or your projects. And um, so we have seen no uh, the researches of our professors around no from the swine flu to. Uh, applications of GIS uh, regression uh, to swine flu fever um the calculus application of calculus no in uh, the dynam dynamical systems through the uh, sample of SARS-CoV SARS-CoV-2 and also text analysis in businesses and others even yung mga operations or the the methodologists in hospitals no in um hindi lang siya limited to business actually no yung text analysis even uh, yung feedback no sa mga offices no sa mga government institutions and so on so applicable pa rin and even analyzing the men, the health uh, the the mental health status no of students no we can also uh, text analysis can also help uh, the university no with that and um, of course, application of integ integrals no, in tomography. So we have learned how those integrals no, are very applicable and they are the foundation of the filter. So kung nakita niyo yung pinakita ni Sir uh, Romel, no? so the applications that you are using in your phone, no? iba't ibang filters ang ginagamit niyo para maka-capture ng best, no? best image of your yourself. So the foundation of that, remember, you're already facing integrals no? If, while you are facing your camera. Ayan. So let us also remember, no, it's a good insight that mathematics saves lives. No? So hindi lang, no? hindi lang yung mga um, higher level applications, but uh, this, this, uh, this lecture series is really an, an, um, an appreciation no, of how mathematics no can save lives and um yun so this is also i hope that you appreciate no uh, this uh, this um um platform no the lecture series as your way of hiking and climbing up to the to stand on the shoulders of giants so we look forward to your active participation in our future uh, lecture seminar and other um, activities of the department. So, meron pa tayong inaabangan na uh, uh, tech talks uh, soon, the, the data talks. No? So, we are also working on that, the detox and the tech talks. So, we na plug na kanina that there, there will be free pizza and other stuff no, during the future natin, the next na 
uh, industry talk with uh, the Davao DeFi Society. I would also like to thank the um, the uh, then the leadership no, or the uh, organizing committee. So the research and development and extension committee headed by uh, Associate Professor Alexis Almosera. And also in partnership with our the Department of uh, Social and Info Committee you know, for spearheading this activity. So without you guys, no, uh, of course, the ITO. So we are also thankful no, to the very supportive Renate na Information Technology uh, Office. So they set up our um, camera here for the hybrid setup of this uh, event. So Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, see you all next time in our next meeting. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, let's have another round of picture again sa mga speakers. Kasi nandito na si ma'am Dayan. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, one more, one more. All right, thank you very much to our speakers and congratulations everyone. Thank you so much sa mga students na nagtangkilik sa ating DMPCS is and of course, let us not forget also to um, sa mga evaluation forms natin. Okay, yes. Okay, so um, once again, um, kindly use this QR code for the evaluation form sa ating lecture series. And of course, finally, let's have another picture taking sa lahat ng mga students. So join na lahat. Diri na lang. Ah, oh, jalang jalang ayo then. Oh, mo na siya. Thank you so much. All right. Um, once again, don't forget to kindly um fulfill the evaluation forms. And lastly, na atay gamay na pahalipay pag exit sa ano room. So ang kaning pahalipay first come first serve na <laughs> So um uh, we we have served some snacks there sa labas. So kindly ano lang. Kung kinsa lang ang nanginahanglan sa snacks, okay? So thank you very much once again for coming and see you in the next na mga series. Yes. Where is it? 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 Where is it?